I've always believed that leaders are not anointed by titles or responsibilities or tenure, but instead are those who bring energy, focus, and compassion to everything they do. So I've decided to put a spotlight on those who are using their unique leadership style to inspire change and drive meaningful action. Join me for a series of powerful conversations that will leave us all thinking about what it means to truly lead. I'm joined today by Lynn McGeary, the founder and CEO of Kratos to Crayons. Cradles is an outstanding organization that provides clothing, shoes, diapers, and other essentials for kids in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco, and right here in Boston. Cradles is also near and dear to my heart, and I'm lucky enough to serve on the board and been volunteering here for the last 10 years. As such, I've had the distinct privilege of watching firsthand as my guest leads the people and communicates to others around her about her success. And let me tell you, she never fails to impress. So it goes without saying that I was thrilled to sit down with Lynn for a conversation on leadership, her journey, and the incredible work and mission of Cradles to Crayons to end clothing insecurity once and for all. Well, Lynn, thank you for being here. Before we begin, I know I probably didn't do a great job of describing all the great work that Cradles to Crayons does and the focus you have for helping your kids across this country. So can we just start by uh, you giving us a little bit more detail on that? Sure. So, Dean, we're a children's nonprofit uh, that is focused on ending clothing insecurity for kids across the United States. So, here in our Giving Factory warehouse, we've got volunteers who come in and they help us inspect, sort, and pack clothing and other supplies that will go out to children across the Commonwealth. We've got giving factories like this in Philadelphia and in Chicago. And then we are also on a mission to just educate people about the very real and hidden need of clothing insecurity that's facing 20 million kids across the United States. So let's take this back to the very beginning, because I heard this awesome story, really cool story about how you started Cradles to Crayons, all the way from an ideation, an idea you had around Christmas time, I think over 20 years ago. But to, to tell, tell the audience how, how you thought about this and started it. Yeah, so Dean, my background is in business consulting and in public policy. I worked in the White House now many years ago, and um, I was home visiting my family in Michigan. Uh, I didn't have any kids of my own at the time, but I was helping my niece get dressed and she was about two and I was pulling things from the drawer and seeing that they still had tags on them but were clearly too small for her. And um, then I would go over to my brother's house who also had really young children and just saw all of the things that the kids needed, but then how quickly they were outgrowing them. And so with my consulting hat on, I thought to myself, this scene kind of replicates itself um, across the country in families that have kids. Kids grow so fast that the things that made a difference to them um, three months before, they're past that. And so what if we could harness all of these beautiful, like new goods and get them into the hands of kids who could really use them? Yeah, that's awesome. I love that story. And uh, taking a business or a startup or a nonprofit from an idea all the way to setting up to an actual company, it's just a huge, huge leap. Tell us a little bit about, you know, how did you make that leap? Who, who are some of the, the folks that supported you and encouraged you to say, hey, that's a great idea. We can, make a, we can make a business out of this or a nonprofit out of this. Tell us a little bit about how that process worked. I think a lot of time we just assume that, oh, we have an idea. Well, it must be that somebody's already put that idea into action. And so um, my very first steps were going and talking to my family and friends who had kids and asked them, would you be willing to donate um, clothing and books and other of the children's supplies? What would you want to know? I went and expanded then my circle of people I was talking to um, and I started calling schools to find out um, again, is this something that you would hold a drive for clothing and what do you need to know about the organization in order to share those resources with me? And then at the same time, I was talking to agencies that were working with families and children who would ultimately be benefiting from the clothing and the books and the other supplies that we were gathering to find out 
is this a need? What age group really um, struggles with getting clothing? Um, and how are you handling that today? And so they would tell me all about Yes, we have families coming in all the time who don't have a winter coat for their child to go to school, who don't have diapers for um, their newborn, and how they as social workers or case managers just don't have the time. It's not in their job description to go and find these resources. And then if they did have people drop off donated goods, there was nowhere to store them. Right, right. And so I was hearing from um, both uh, the supply side that, hey, if you could uh, really reassure us that these items are gonna go to a child who could really benefit from them. And then I was hearing from the voices representing the families uh, that they need to be like new, very high quality items and it's got to be a resource that's reliable because we don't want to lift expectations and then have to um, you know and then have to say no as a CEO of a small business or any business you, you, you have to wear a lot of hats you have to do a lot of things you mentioned a few there uh, tell us what it's like as a day in the life I, I know you're here in Boston but you've got locations all over the country you know, what is the day in the life of Lynn, the CEO, Lynn Margario? <laughs> well, Dean, you know, a nonprofit is like any other business where essentially we have to do what we do well. We've got to do it efficiently. We've got to replicate it. And that takes staff. It takes systems and it takes infrastructure to get that all humming. And so my role is to help set the vision of where is it that we are headed as an organization. Our, the need we are seeking to fill is enormous. So what can we as an organization do to position ourselves to serve ever more children across the United States and do it preserving our quality equals dignity value. It's to be a support for our team and to help set a culture of teamwork, inclusivity, excellence, and passion for this mission. And it's out there, frankly, getting the word out about all the work that people can engage in to support our mission. Uh, it's raising money, it's building awareness of clothing insecurity, and it's finding amazing people to get behind this mission. Yeah, and you've been doing it for over 20 years. And, and congratulations, last year we celebrated 20 year anniversary here at Cradles to Crayons, and you've been doing it for such a long time. But when you, when you look back over the last 20 years, you know, can you give us a few things that, that you're most proud of? I mean, we're in this fantastic building and you've built such an amazing organization, but what are you most proud of over the last 20 years? There are so many memories and images that flood my brain right now, but, you know, as I think about it, uh, you know, reaching our first one million child served milestone now several years ago was something I never imagined we would get to when I started Cradles to Crayons. Um, so that was, that was pretty amazing. Um, opening up our um, giving factories um, here and uh, in other locations. I also have an image of an amazing nonprofit leader, Sister Margaret Leonard, here in the Boston area, who started this organization, Project Hope, that's focused on supporting um, families struggling with homelessness. And uh, we've partnered with them from the very beginning, and I'll never forget her sharing that Cradles to Crayons is special, not just because of what you do and the clothing and the coats and the shoes and the backpacks that we get from you, but it's how you do it. And right, right. for me, that spoke volumes because it speaks about the team and it speaks about the community that is behind this organization seeking to provide dignity remove stress, 
and get a child equipped with these essentials they need to just be kids. Right, that's incredible, and, and thank you for that, and thank you for all your teams doing. I'm gonna switch gears on you just for a second. I read also somewhere that you describe yourself as a service junkie. So tell us a little bit about what that means and why you describe that, and then why volunteering and why service is so critically important to, to everything we do. Yep. When I started Cradles to Crayons, again, it was this image of this onesie that was too small for my niece, Elise. So I had this sense of supply, and it was trying to figure out a supply chain that could efficiently move lots of goods from over here to here. Nowhere in my head did I have a sense of how that was going to happen, and how was I going to get into all of these homes of people um, get the things that were of really great condition and then move them to uh, the family, get them to the families and children who could really benefit from them. So that one day I was in our very first um, giving factory warehouse, which was in Quincy, Massachusetts uh, at the time. And I looked around, I didn't know a soul in the giving factory at that time. There were just people off at processing tables. They were inspecting tops right, and right. bottoms. They were putting outfits together. They were packing orders. And I thought, wow, there's such power here in people coming to volunteer. I don't know them. They don't know me. We're connected here by this mission. And they were having a blast. And so that, for me, that was literally nine months into starting Cradles to Crayons. And so for me, that really gave me that aha moment that this idea is something that has legs and I now know how this is going to be powered. It's going to be powered by people who want to make a difference. They were helping Cradles to Crayons, but they were also getting a lot out of right, it. Right parents coming with their kids, school groups coming, corporate groups coming. So now, 20 years into this, we've had over a million volunteers who have enabled us to provide more than four and a half million packages to kids across the country. Yeah, and as you said, you have a lot of youth volunteers as well. So, and, and I think even my own kids have come here and uh, have worked in the, in the factory and for you at, at various times. So are we in good hands? Tell us a little bit about <laughs> what you're seeing from some of the younger generation coming in and volunteering and making it a part of their life as well. And what have you learned from what have you learned from that? I learn something every day. I thinking back on one of our big events, we have our Ungala event where it's families who um, come in to volunteer at the end of the year. And there was this little girl who I'm going to guess she was five years old. And I overheard her talking to her dad saying, I know why we're here. We learned about this in class. It's called kindness. And I was blown away yeah, yeah. by the insight from a five-year-old. We have school groups in volunteering all the time. We have a teen leadership program that is amazing across all of our locations. They come up with brilliant ideas for collecting product, for doing fundraisers, for getting the word out there. They're really great ambassadors for our mission. And I would credit the young people for what we're seeing with um, corporate social responsibility and the movements that we're seeing. We have the volunteer leaders who come here who are signing teams up from corporations large and small. Oftentimes, they're fresh out of school yeah, and yeah. they grew up volunteering at an organization like Cradles to Crayons. So it's part of who they are, it's part of what they expect, it's part of what they see themselves continuing. The youth are really leading the way. And then as far as within Cradles to Crayons, I would say that it's the younger people in the organization that are really driving our work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. They are passionate about it. The vocabulary is natural to them. And they are teaching me 
um, how to be a better leader of the organization and, um, and really how to ask questions, how to be an ally for people who are, you know, for people with backgrounds that are yeah, different right. than mine. Yeah. And I so appreciate that. I would love same to, in my company. I would it's love to hear, Dean. Um, yeah. yeah, it is is exactly the same. We learn every day about when, when and they have energy. They come into it and and they gui often guide us the way and how we should be thinking about different issues and and topics and how to help people and how to understand people better. So I love it and I love them uh, coming in and and we encourage that dialogue all day long. There is the individual side of volunteers, which is awesome. And I know you also. The private sector plays a huge role here as well. And I just want to give, you know, my own company, Bank of America, obviously is in here. But I see many other companies around here that are supporting cradles. They're doing what's right. They actively give. And they're great supporters of yours as well. Can you talk a little bit about that collaboration too? We are powered by volunteers across the board. And our corporate volunteer teams are incredibly dynamic competitive and they get a lot done so when especially when I think about our really busy times of the year here in the giving factory it is amazing to see this warehouse full of individuals in their corporate t-shirts having a great time maybe even meeting their colleagues for the first time it's a great conversation too to have because you learn about a co-worker in a different you know in a different way when you're out you're volunteering right, it's right. about That's giving yeah. back you know so we would not be where we are as an organization continually growing and serving more children year over year if it weren't for the support both the volunteer support, the awareness support, skills-based support, funding, awareness, all of those things that companies can bring to the table uh, to support cradles to crayons or organizations like ours. And I think it's really exciting what's happening um, and what can happen as companies really step in and play more of a leadership role on um, equity and opportunity health of you know individuals and the health of our planet i think um it's an exciting time yeah i totally agree and uh, you touched on leadership and i know you and i talk about leadership a lot and the importance of it and you know so looking back over your career but what's the best leadership advice you've received uh, uh over the years and what would you pass on to folks listening yes um so I'd have to say, I mean, I've received a lot of advice over, over time, um, but I think back to one of those early conversations when you asked me about just getting this organization off the ground, because again, my background is not nonprofit. It is now for over 20 years, but right. you know, I was a sector switcher. And so um, I, got a meeting with two founders of City Year, Michael Brown and Alan Casey, and I sat down with them and I shared my idea and they said to me, get comfortable asking for help because as a leader, especially of a nonprofit organization, you are going to be able to do so much more if you invite other people to get involved and you make it easy for people to get involved. I, I am an introvert and by nature, and so, um, so that was something where I had to kind of get out of my comfort zone and you know get past, okay, I've been successful talking to my family, to my friends, to my coworkers. Yeah, you got them all to work for you. About so this you organization. Yeah. And so now I have to go out of, uh, out of my comfort zone. But what I found was, um, you know, for me, it was the prep work in advance. Okay, what I care about this mission. I have to put my concern about, you know, taking this personally, it's not about me. It's about what I am seeking to do with this mission. And then if I get myself ready and prepared to sit with someone and, and share, here's what the need is, here's what we're planning to do about it, and I need your help, I just found that 
I would repeat that. And yes, I'd get a bunch of no's, but I'd also get a lot of yeses. Right. And if I wasn't out there asking for help, then I would never get the yeses. And I've now come to realize that a lot of no's are no's for now. There might be some reason why someone can't help out or it's not a good time, but that's not to say that some point down the road, there'll be an opportunity for us to come together. And then whenever we have a new employee starting here, that's one of the first things that we encourage everyone to do is ask a lot of questions, ask your colleagues for help because we're all in this together. Yeah, I, I love that. I also love, you know, challenging yourself to get out of your comfort zone along with that, which I, I heard in there uh, that you did early and often, and so that's great advice. Dean, I love that question, and I would love to hear what answer you have for what's the best leadership advice you've gotten. You have to lead by example. You, If you're going to be leading large groups of individuals, you've got to be able to roll up your sleeves and do it and learn about it and understand it before you ask somebody else to do it but basically you, you've got to uh, make sure you can deliver and make sure you're working within the team and then it makes it easier for people to follow you and uh, uh, go with you as you said uh, for you know 20 years or so mm -hmm. so and what inspired you to do this leadership series I got such great advice over my career over the last 30 years and uh, a lot of great leaders that I've worked for and they've all had such great advice so you know, starting this off is, is a way for me to share everything that's happened in the last 30 years to people, you know, maybe towards the end of their career, but also people who are just starting out in the beginning of their career, and, and we can learn together, and, and I love to interact with the people and get their feedback, because most of them say, oh, yeah, yeah, I've experienced that, or, or, or I've been in that situation, so uh, we thought we'd do this uh, series uh, just to, to hit on those points a little bit more in depth with individuals like yourself who come on and share their career experiences as well. Well, I'm happy to be part of this. And thank thank you. you for being the first. I appreciate <laughs> that. I do want to thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you being here, sharing everything from start to finish and all the great work you do. Cradles to Crayons is a phenomenal organization and me as an individual and also as a leader at Bank America are always going to support you guys because you guys do such great work and uh, we love what you're doing for our communities and for all the kids in needs all over the country. So thank you again for everything you do and um, I'm sure we'll see each other soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dean. I appreciate it. Up next in the series, I'll sit down with NBA stars Andre Iguodala and Evan Turner. We'll discuss what motivates them both as athletes, investors, and philanthropists, and how they view the intersections of leadership, business, and sports. 